Today's Animal Spirits episode is brought to you by our friends at YCharts. Remember, YCharts is a research platform that enables smarter investments and better prospect and client communications. We use this for our client communications. Let them know Animal Spirits sent you and get 20% off of your new subscription. Michael, what YCharts data are we looking at today? All right, what we're looking at is a chart for the ages, Ben, and I do not use those words lightly. For the past 40 years, interest rates and inflation have both gone from the upper left to the lower right. They've both gone down. And now we're in this really weird period in time where even though interest rates are rising, which I think we have a chart of the two-year in here later for today. Yep. Uh, the 10 years now above 2%, but inflation is so far ahead. Actually, just eyeballing this, we've never had inflation this far ahead of interest rates, ever. And for a little bit, they were both rising at the same pace and then rates basically just sputtered out. And yeah, they've been rising a little bit. So the question- Isn't it funny when you when you see prognosticators say like, interest rates spiked today and it's like a 10 basis point increase or something? It, it seems so small, but I guess that's a relative basis. The, the big question is, is the Fed able to navigate this sort of soft landing where we can have inflation moderate without going into a recession, which I don't think- not that there's that many examples of this, but Tim Dewey on Odd Lots was talking about this. We've never had this before where the Fed or or the economy has reigned in inflation without a recession. So will this be the exception? Could be. This, 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 the last two years are filled with exceptions. So we'll see. All right, go to go to Y Charts, tell them we sent you. You'll get 20% off your initial subscription. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Michael, we're at 7.5% now. I keep waiting for inflation to stop going up. It doesn't, it's not happening. <laughs> Eventually it's going to happen. <laughs> uh, it hasn't happened yet. I finally subscribed to Matt Klein's Substack, and I see that you put his, his story in here. It, I think it's worth it because the way he breaks this stuff down is, is helpful. So Matt Klein has been writing about uh, inflation. He's been breaking it down into its components, its subcomponents. And one of the big themes was a lot of this was supply chain COVID-related issues. But now, n- over 90% of the components are above the Fed's target, which is 2%. And Matt Klein wrote, and we'll show this chart, this, this gorgeous chart, he wrote, the consumer price index rose b- by 0.6% on a seasonally adjusted basis relative to December. The drivers of that increase, however, have begun to shift from pandemic-sensitive categories into everything else. So I was going through the report and it's it's everywhere. We spoke about this with Derek Thompson. Beef up 16%, chicken up 10%, gasoline up 40%, furniture and bedding up 17%, apparel up 5%. Uh I I you know how much I spent on the tank the other day? 80 bucks. Okay. Uh it's up a lot. 80 bucks. Right? What is it in New York? Four bucks yet? I think it's 350. Okay, pretty close to here. So Connor Sen had this piece in Bloomberg where he said, listen, the Fed has two choices, basically. And I think maybe we give the Fed too much credit here, but still. Speak he's for yourself. Like, Speak for yourself. <laughs> right. He's saying, but he's saying, I'm just saying, like, if the Fed was going to do something about this inflation, they probably had to do something a long time ago, like to get ahead of this, is what I'm saying. So they're, they're playing catch up a little bit. But he said, should we accept this boomflation where we have higher growth, higher wages, and and throw out that 2% inflation rate and say, okay, maybe our target now is more like 4% or 3%. And 2% is ridiculous because if we do that 2%, then that's pretty much going to have to be a recession. So what is the what would the Fed rather do? And obviously, I would think the boomflation scenario is preferable. Some people don't agree with that, and they want us to get thrown into a recession. I think the, the boomflation of keeping nominal growth higher and wages higher and dealing with a little bit higher inflation probably is the better alternative, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. The question is, and again, Tim Dewey was talking about this with, with, uh, Joe and Tracy, we can't know, but what if the fed started to hike last year? Do you think that would have done anything to, to, to moderate inflation? Yeah. The, the count, the lack of counterfactuals here is, is tough. No, I'm, I'm asking your opinion. I honestly, I don't, I honestly don't know because how much of it is, coincidence and how much of it is actual the fed doing something i really like is the consumer demand and consumer balance sheet so strong that everyone's gonna say who cares about the fed like 
I, I want to get into it a little later on Disney, but Disney parks were at capacity. Do you think those people who are spending thousands of dollars at Disney are going to go, ah, geez, the Fed just hiked to 50 basis points. I better, I better cut back on this trip again. I don't know if consumers care what the Fed does at this point. No, I absolutely, until- I, I agree with you. I, I, I honestly, I honestly don't know what, what overnight rates rising them to less than zero would have done to moderate CPI. Now, I do think that they should have raised rates, right? Because I, I no longer think that we need like emergency uh, or cutting, at least positions, cutting back necess- on all their bond purchases. That yeah, we I, about that I, it's not necessary. But I, at the same time, I don't necessarily think that that would have uh, slowed down inflation. So I, I don't know how much this really matters, the psychology of like what's what the market is pricing in in terms of the Fed rate hikes. So we looked at this on Kelshi and Kelshi has these bets that you can do for the interest rates in March that the Fed's going to set. But the, the, market, set a- the market is moving so fast, right? Like they're already the market already hiked, right? Like overnight yes, rates are still exactly. at zero, but the market already hiked. And look, yeah. look how, look, uh, I'm, I'm pointing you to my screen. Like you, you can't see my screen. I'm looking at this. So after the CPI report came out, I put a bet on that there was going to be a 50 basis point rate hike in March. So you, I bought the, I bought the yes contracts for 28 cents. I did it a, a couple weeks ago just because I, I felt like what that it was priced pretty good. I thought I almost took it off actually. And I probably, I should have in hindsight, but we'll see. I'm just, now, now I'm riding with it. it so it anyway, it, shot, it shot up, it shot up from 28 cents to around 70 cents. And now it came back down, but these market, like the market is moving so, so, so fast to your point like, of what the fed might do. If the fed is going to do, and people say like, we need to get back to normalize 2% or some, whatever the, that rate is. But you're right that the market could do this for the Fed, and they might not even have to get to those levels if inflation cooperates. We don't know if it will. There was a closed door meeting yesterday. What did you guys talk about? <laughs> you had to look at the size of my briefcase <laughs> to know what it what it really <laughs> meant. I, I ben, mean, that, ben, this is this is this is a, this is a beautiful chart. So Carl Quintanilla tweeted this chart. Uh, it's a chart of CPI divided by median. What is this household income? So he wrote this. This chart's from J.P. Morgan, and he wrote. Uh, is inflation triggering demand destruction? Not at current levels. CPI divided by median household income paints a different picture about the U.S. consumer's ability to absorb higher prices. While energy prices are back to 2014 levels, incomes are 25% higher. So somebody, I can't remember who, quote tweeted this and said, the truth is much different than the picture that's being painted on the, in the newspapers. Like that inflation is killing us. And we spoke last week about is inflation like, changing uh, consumer uh, preferences and habits. Not yet, it's not. Because my point has been this whole time, consumer balance sheets are as strong as they've ever been. So if we've ever been able to handle inflation, it's now. Obviously, you could look at individual cases and show when that's not the case. But as a whole, the collective country balance sheets for households have never been in a better spot to handle this right. exact situation. Right. So we're going to talk later about Chipotle. But Neil Irwin tweeted, uh, Chipotle reported earnings last week. The CEO of Chipotle, Brian Nichols, said, We've done 6% price increases so far in 2022. Room for more. See no resistance from customers to price increases so far. Actually, I got resistance. I have resistance. I'm resisting. I'm going to, I'm going to the no, city No, you're Thursday. not. You're, you're, I, you, you, you tweet about it and that's it. That's all I'm you do. Going, you t- no, I'm, I, I, this, is, this is above my line. This matters to me. If I'm not paying, I'm not paying $14 for a chicken bowl. I will draw the line. If, that's my, that is my upper bound. Okay. I'm not going above 14. That's the price for me if I do double meat. So maybe once a week I'll get double meat. Just, you know, eh, got to, you know, treat yourself. I, I still think it's a pretty good deal. 14 bucks? I don't know. It's not a, okay. It's, it's more New York, obviously, but you pay $14 for a beer in New York. No, no, what I don't. What are you complaining? Oh, I, pay, I pay $19 for a cocktail. I don't pay $14 okay. for a beer. <laughs> I, but but that's the point though is that people are not changing their behavior and that I think these corporations like are going to keep towing the line to see how far they can push this because they can. All right, so a lot of people have been talking about this crazy smile you whatever you want in the two-year yields. It's kind of crazy. So in December 2019, right before the onset of the pandemic, end of 2019, two-year yields were at 1.6%. Inflation was at 2.3%. Now, two-year yields are back right at 1.6 almost, 1.5. And inflation is at 7.5. And people are saying like these are violent moves up. And they are like on a relative basis. Feel, are you poo-pooing this? This this look at this chart. I feel like you're you're not giving enough credence to the fact that this absolutely matters. There's two ways of looking at this. One way, this is really crazy. And it is kind of insane. Like, so it was at a low of nine basis points basically a year ago. So rates are up 17 times over a year. 
It's a huge from that move. low. It's a, That's a huge move. move. On the other hand, people must say like, oh, bonds are getting crushed. Look at SHY, this SHY chart I put in here. This is the one to three-year treasury bond. So this is basically two-year treasuries. This is the ETF on a total return basis. Rates are up 17 times. This bond ETF is down 2%. So like people always worry about like bonds are going to get crushed when rates rise, especially on the shorter to mid duration range. That's not what happens at all. This thing is getting getting crushed by inflation, not rising rates. So after inflation, it's down 10%. Right, But rising rate basis is only down. I'm I'm saying people have always worried for years because you have this inverse relationship between bond prices and yields and whatever nerd talk. You're right. You're right. But you're right. But my my counterpoint would be that SHY, that that 2% down move just took out two and a half years worth of income. Yeah, but your income is now back to one and a half percent. So now that's the point. So we've been, we've been very consistent saying this. We need rates to rise. If you're yes. a fixed income investor and most of us have some exposure to bonds, sure, you're going to take a step backwards. But the only way we're ever going to make money on bonds is by having some erosion tower principle in the short term. So we can take one step back to hopefully take two steps forward. And that, so that's I'd, actually, love, I'd love for rates to rise. And that's actually why short term bonds are a pretty good inflation hedge, because you get those higher rates sooner because the, the bonds that are in your portfolio are maturing faster and you're getting to move up the rate curve quicker than you are in long term. So I think the TLT I looked, which is the 20 to 30 year treasury is down like 10%, but those are long-term bonds and you're not moving up as fast because rates aren't moving up there. So Ben, we got, a, we got um, an email from a listener who said he started listening to our podcast a year ago, decided to listen to the podcast on March 25th, 2020, because I really want to hear your perspective on the market. There is such an unbelievably volatile time um, apparently I called the short-term bottom. So I was like, uh, very excited to go back and listen to that podcast. So that was like a good, so market bottom on the 23rd, right? Yeah. I will say all credit to us, not because I called the short-term bottom and that was not a call. I went back and I listened to it. I was not pounding the table. I was basically like, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Right. Like, it, so <laughs> right. I was sort of disappointed that I wasn't more emphatic, but, but, but credit to us because listening back to that, we were very level-headed, I think. We were like, if you listen to the podcast, I don't know that you would have thought that markets were down 35%. I think we might have said it a few times, but I think we were we were pretty, uh, that was interesting to go back and listen to. So We were also yeah. running on pure adrenaline and doing two podcasts a week and uh, doing it from our closet or our bedroom, basically. But what, what, what you did say, though, this is a good quote from you. You said, uh, in 10 to 15 years from now, I'm not going to care about what the markets did in 2020. So why would I change my investment philosophy now when stocks are at a discount? I think that was a combo of you and I, this person said. Um, How about this one? I, I, this is, yeah. I, I don't know if I said this, someone quoted us. If we, get no, inflation, did, did, if, if we get inflation 12 months from now, that means we won. I would be stoked. That was me. You literally said that. Okay. Uh, and I feel like having that sentiment because people were, that, that, like, Good on a lot of people. People were con- like concerned about inflation even back then. Like it's it's going to come from this potentially, and I still think I still believe that that the alternative also, is worse. To, credit credit to those people because there were a lot of people that were like actually saying that there would be inflation. Right. Uh, also, you you did a blog post last night with another uh, listener email. A lot of people think that if you have an audience, you're bound to get trolls and people like dunking on you. We, we do get some of that. But for the most part, our listeners send really valuable feedback and good stuff to read and charts. And like, we have a great, great audience. That email we got last night was, blew me away. It was fantastic. So we'll, uh, we'll share that in the show. Credit to the audience for being so good. So much credit, just tons of credit. All right, um, this this chart seems sort of out of place, but this, this uh, oh, so this is, a, this is a good tease for Monday's episode. We have, is it Julian Kosky? Yeah, that's the name, right? We have Julian yeah. Kosky back on the show from New Age Alpha. He was the guy that that came up with the H factor, which we got a lot of good feedback on that. And one of the things the H factor does is it basically determines how much noise is in the price, or what are the I should I, I, that's a, that's not true. The growth probability is implied in the price, right? And one of the things that he basically said like that, trying to figure out what's priced in. Yeah, and one of the things that he said that surprised me because I was I teed him up for Tesla, thinking that it was so overpriced. He's like, no. Tesla has had a low H factor, which is a good thing, low probability of failure because they keep beating expectations. And this chart that we're looking at shows the electric vehicles. I knew that surprised uh, you because you follow up with like three follow-up questions and you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> it was not the conclusion. That's kind of like every once in a while, I'll have a blog post in my head and I'll look at the data and whatever I have. Sometimes I have my conclusion ahead of time. And, and I look at the data. Del- you just del- you delete your post. Yeah, I, no, I no, I deleted my <laughs> conclusion, and I had to change it because the data yeah. shows something different. 
Um, all right, so, so electric vehicles as a percentage of all cars sold. Uh, it was basically, it was zero in 2010. Uh, and it's almost 9%. And this is, uh, this is important. I, I have a, I just started a lease five or six months ago. The next car I get will probably be electric. I'd be surprised if it's not. Don't you think it's, we're getting to that point where you have to start thinking about making this, like I always thought, remember we had conversations in years past about when our kids are 16, they're probably going to be having self-driving cars. Maybe that future will still happen, but they are for sure going to be driving electric cars. I, I, there's almost no doubt in my mind that that's going to happen. Well, I definitely want an electric car after paying 80 bucks for gas. I'm jealous. Right. Yes. <laughs> it's not bad. I, yeah, I, I think my next car will probably likely be electric. Well, good news in, in the cars. Uh, used car prices are flattening out. Finally. Isn't th- this is the whole thing about consumers, though, that how starved they are. Like, this is the one area for the last year, if I would tell someone, like, you know, pump the brakes, change your spending habits, don't get a car if you don't absolutely need one, right? Like the, 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 the prices for cars and used cars especially are insane. So that's like one area where you could have helped yourself. And I say this as both of us got cars in the last year, but especially in the used side, if you could have held off, that would have made a lot of sense and probably helped. You I didn't get a car. I bought my. I bought my. I bought my lease out. Oh, that's right. You bought your own car. You bought it. Oh, that's right. You had not to brag. You had, and I. I did it. Look, I mean, I, I must have done it six months before things spiked because they were asking me to trade my lease in, and I got, I got a deal. So we got lucky. My wife, we paid a lot more for hers, probably. Ben, but can this, I say something? Yes. Oh, finish your thought. Finish your thought. No, go ahead. Um, I that that email about me calling a bottom has me feeling a little bit confident. Okay. So you what know what you, I'm gonna do? What are you calling I'm, I'm now? Gonna, <laughs> I'm going to call it top in inflation. Oh, okay. Uh, we, there's this great chart. Liz Ann Saunders shared it. Uh, New York Fed survey of consumer expectations. The median one year ahead expected inflation rate and median three year ahead exp- expected inflation rate rolled over pretty nicely. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. That's I would it. love to know That's where it. this comes from. Price, prices have peaked. You may be right, but I would love to know who they're surveying on this and where those expectations come from. Like, do we really think c- consumer expectations on inflation are a good indicator? There's no way, right? Mm, I mean, probably not, but. <laughs> I mean, you, you, I'm saying you could be right, but I, I can't imagine people have a very good read on what inflation is going to be, even if, even if this turns out to be true. Although I, I will say that I am coming around to the idea that the, the supply chain dynamics was over discussed. Tim Dewey gave, I keep talking about, he gave this great analogy about it's hard to know where it comes from supply versus demand. He said, it's like a scissor. Like you don't know which blade is cutting the piece of paper and not enough is being made of like the actual pent up demand. Yeah, I agree. And and that's the thing is consumers are consumers. I'm the, I'm the captain now, right? That yep. And you months ago, you said, thank God there are supply chain issues. Because what if we were oh, able? Right. Yes. What if we were actually able to satisfy demand? Inflation would be way higher. Again, a counterfactual that we'll never know, but I think that's I think it's plausible that inflation would be just the same if demand was able to be met. Yes. All I know is I would have gotten my car fixed a lot sooner, and I would have got a washer that matches, and not have two different washer dryer combos now. What do you think has the biggest time inflation? What I'm hearing it's furniture. Oh, that's you know they had a story today in the New York Times about garage doors. So if you're building a new home. It takes a long time to make a garage door, apparently. A lot of weird things like that. So I, I guess if you're buying furniture, you want to buy something that's in stock and not get something that is is crazy or hard to change, right? Yeah. All right. Interest rates coming back up on a high yield savings accounts. Are they though? I don't know. That's what this chart is showing, though. Okay. I feel like the Marcus one has been at fifty basis points forever. No, forty. Really? I oh, is it at fifty? Like, yeah, it's at fifty basis points. I don't know. We spoke about this. What and we'll 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 talk about stable coins and BlockFi in a minute. But what interest rate on cash would entice you to take money out of stable coins or something like that? Three percent. Three. Oh, that's not happening. Exactly. I know exactly. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is, is that these things act on a lag. So the Fed will raise rates, and then these places will wait a little bit, and then they'll raise a little bit, and then by the time the like, I mean, let's be honest. The Fed is only raising rates to cut rates in the future, right? Like we're going to be back at zero and 
we're gonna be back at zero in the next five to seven years. Let's just let's be honest. Oh, that's yeah, fact. Right? I mean, so I mean, I'm, we're, yeah, we're raising rates so we can lower them in the future. That that's that's all we're doing here. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this because we have so much to get to. But this is a really good chart I want to share. Gabriel Zuckman tweeted: real income growth per adult in 2021 broken down, uh, and the real income growth is 7.6 percent, which is great, matches inflation, but it it, it varies. And one of the reasons for, to the, you know, to the extent that, that we have a divide in this country, and we certainly do, it's because the middle class has not kept up. The middle 40%, only 5.1% wage growth. This is why people are unhappy, because the lower yeah. end is doing better, the higher end is doing better, and if you're in the middle, you're kind of getting screwed. And you're, you're yeah. looking, you're saying the people below me are doing better, people above me are doing better, what, what, what do I get? So I listened to... I listened to shout out to Derek Thompson this morning. I was looking for, I, I, I wanted to know what's going on with, with, with Canada and the trucker protests. Cause I keep seeing it, but I haven't read anything about it. Want to get the TLDR in it. So I went to the daily, uh, the New York times podcast. They don't have anything on it. Like inexplicably, how's that possible? Uh, and then this morning, Derek Thompson dropped a podcast. And one of the things, one of the, like the, the undercurrents of that protest is just people are pissed off. And it's not necessarily a, a vaccine like uh, rally. It's just people are upset, and wages and economic splits are a huge part of that. So, so I don't want to like if you want to learn more about I, it. I don't want to poo poo like this stuff going on in the news and people being angry. But that was the best part about being away last week and Disney for a whole week is just I I felt like I was on like Disney feels like its own little country in some ways. Like you, you're totally disconnected from everything and being away from the day-to-day news. I mean, obviously it's on your phone and you can check it if you want, but just being out of that grind was really, really nice. And not, not having to worry about anything in the outside world for a week. Yeah. It was really yeah. enjoyable. Oh, I just want to shout this out. A listener sent this to us. Ben, you've asked about this before. Fidelity actually offers a custodial, custodial Roth IRA. I funded one last year for my six-year-old with money he earned doing minor chores around the yard. Uh, he talked with two CPAs. And they saw no issue. As long as you actually report any income for the child, that would be taxable. And don't go overboard trying to max it out at two years old. You can give them a huge leg forward on, uh, on savings and investing. So and I've, as a I've, Roth, it doesn't, doesn't affect financial aid. That's cool. I knew there was another blogger I know who would include pictures of his kids on the blog. And he would pay them for it. And that income, could, that, that way they have income and then they can contribute to a Roth. This is great and all, but it sounds like a, too, too much of a pain in the ass for me. Like, it's just easier to put like... Part of it for me is like, do I really want to go through the time and effort of doing this and then filing a tax return for them? Like, just make it easy and let them fund a Roth. That's all All I'm saying, government. We've heard from people for a while since we launched our crypto index asking when is it going to be available for other people, retail and advisors, and we're getting there. Uh, Retail, not yet. Advisors, yes. I am doing a webinar with Jeremy uh, Schwartz and the OnRamp team on February 22nd. At 1 p.m. Eastern, where we'll discuss the index and how advisors can access it for their clients. So we'll link to that. That is on February 22nd. And I think second. one of the coolest things about this, the whole crypto team at Wisdom Tree that they've built is has been a great resource for us. Yeah. They are very sharp, and that, that's been cool to work with them. Um, all right. So crypto ads at the Super Bowl was a big topic. It's a big topic. You know, Look before, we, before we get into yeah. this, yeah, yeah. My, my favorite tweet from that night was, it was a comedian and he said, you know, the, the only reason I'm still kind of nervous about crypto is because if crypto is going to be money, you never see commercials for money. You don't, <laughs> you don't have to advertise money. Money just is. Anyway, I thought that was pretty good. Not a fan. Not a fan. Oh, come on. That was pretty good. No, it's not. These are commercials for Coinbase. You don't see TD Ameritrade. Uh, E-Trade advertised. I know, I know. It, it, it's just kind of funny. But anyway. All right. So, oh, I didn't tell you. I did, uh, uh, this chart is from Fintech Frank. It's showing crypto app rankings on the App Store and Coinbase obviously spiked to like, I don't know if it was number one, but it was close to it. I did a podcast yesterday with Fintech Frank and I let him know what a big fan I was. Oh, nice. He's the, with the, must, the mustache, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, was, it, was, it was a thrill. All right. Um, before we get into the BlockFi stuff, uh, I want to talk about two things quickly. So I'm buying NFTs. Don't judge me. Um, and <laughs> I, I don't just... I'm, I'm judging you. <laughs> I don't just have ETH like sitting in my MetaMask wallet. So I buy it on Coinbase. I try and transfer it over to 
my MetaMask wallet. If somebody has a better way for me to get money in my MetaMask wallet, it doesn't take this long. Please let me know. Look at this. Look at this. The, so you could send $1,000 instantly, but the rest of your purchase will be available to send in 12 days Oof. after your funds arrive. 12 days. Now, okay. I, th I think a workaround is I could have just wired money in instead of doing an ACH. I think that probably would have solved it. So I got a thing yesterday I told you. Robinhood emailed me and said, hey, you're off the wait list for crypto. We have a I'm crypto so wallet now. You can move crypto on and off Robinhood. I said, great. So I signed up. I had to do like a two-factor authentication thing. It was pretty easy. And then they send me an email saying, hey, you're ready to go. And so I try. It was pretty painless to sign up. And then I go to try. I said, all right, I'm going to practice. I'm going to try it today. I'm going to move some of my ETH off and I'm going to move it to BlockFi. And I go to do it. And first thing it says, you can only transfer $3,000 or less every 24 hours. Um, I have more than $3,000 in crypto, not to brag. Uh, so I was trying <laughs> to move a little more. Uh, but then... I got my, you know, you copy the thing of where to send it. It's like this huge string of letters and numbers. And I tried to transfer it to BlockFi. And I, when I put it in there, it said, this, this address is not supported. We can't move it for you. Um, See, okay. So what are you going to do? You'd open a Coinbase account? I don't, I have no idea. Uh, opening a Coinbase account doesn't help me at all because the only reason I, I have a great to idea. Move it to Gemini, put it into our index. Isn't that, I mean, that's what I'm going to do. Oh, that's right. I can do that now. I can move that. crypto to on-ramp. All right. You just solved my I, problem for me. You're welcome. I actually did that. I did that. Not with Robinhood, but I moved money into my wallet at on-ramp, and it was pretty easy. But this, so, so obviously Robinhood, so if you have a lot in crypto at Robinhood, they're not going to make it easier for you to move a bunch of money off all yeah, at of once. Course they're not. Of course they're not. Of course they're not. Um, all, right. all right. So tons the, the, of we've got a tons of questions on BlockFi. We're about to get there. We're about to okay. get there, I promise. Um, so when CPI was released on Friday, were you at your computer? No, you were in Disney. No, I was at Disney. Okay. So uh, Bitcoin, with e along with every other risk asset, whoosh, lower, right? And it's a good thing that I didn't tweet anything about Bitcoin being an inflation hedge, LOL, uh, because about 30 minutes later, inexplicably, <laughs> it reversed way higher. Like it went from 45 immediately down to like 43. And then back all the way up like an hour later. People always say, okay, it's the algos doing this. And obviously it is. Like they see the, they see the number and then they go, Wh whose accounts are tied to these algos? Who are the idiots who are selling Bitcoin because they see a headline and then buying, like who, who's invested, whose money is this? It's hedge, it's hedge funds, right? What, I mean, what else is it? Is it who else is writing these? Okay, these but they're, it's, it's, it's Bitcoin hedge funds. Then they're the dumb money, right? They see a headline, the headline, I'm going to sell. <laughs> How stupid are they? Right. Uh, I cannot agree more. But uh, Bitcoin is many things. First and foremost, it's a risk asset. Yes. Right. Like it's it's a risk asset, and I, maybe I, there will maybe there will be a time where equities puke and Bitcoin moons. But I I doubt it. Yeah. Maybe. I, maybe not. And, and the other thing about it is, I think one of the things that people really took for granted with the growth stocks getting killed is. Not only like people think about asset class diversification and strategy diversification, but how about diversification of your investor base? So that investor base, the of what what's the what's the Carl Weathers uh, Schwarzenegger meme where they they hold hands like this? So it's growth investors, both growth oh, it's growth <laughs> investors and crypto investors are all the same thing. So growth stocks. Oh, what's killed. his name in that? You son of a bitch! Um, oh man, it's on the tip of my tongue. I, can't remember uh, can't remember. I love that movie. So, but that if you have growth investors getting killed, eventually they're probably gonna have to sell some crypto too. And so like you have all these same people holding. So I think my point is crypto, maybe this is why they're doing all the ads. They need a more diverse investor base, right? Yes. Who's not just tech people who are invested in growth stocks as well. And I think that's probably coming. Um, okay. All right. So the deal is that BlockFi is paying a $100 million fine. I believe 50 is going to the SEC. 50 is going to the states. Here's the deal. We'll try and break it down as good as we can. And First I'm of all, up. we yeah. get treated like we work at BlockFi, by the way, with the <laughs> amount of questions that we get. Oh, fair enough. Fair we've enough. We've had, no, no, it's true. But we had Zach on the show a bunch of times. And he, yeah. to his credit, he put out a, a thread on Twitter kind of explaining stuff. Here's my initial read of this without getting into the details first. Okay. I, th I think the SEC is dumb. The way that they're so handling dumb. this, ridiculous. It doesn't. So it's not like BlockFi was taking advantage of people. It's not like they were doing something nefarious. They put this product. I mean, essentially, what they did is something like what Uber did or Airbnb, where the the regulations weren't in place for this type of product. 
So they kind of just did it, and since the SEC didn't have it in place, now the SEC is going back and saying, whoa, 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 you can't do that. Well, 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 I think what they got banged for was, let's just read it. Uh, BlockFi made a material misrepresentation to investors, to BIA investors, concerning the level of risk in its loan portfolio. Beginning at the time of the BIA launch on March 4th, 2019, BlockFi made a statement in multiple website posts that its institutional loans were typically over-collateralized, when in fact, most institutional loans were not. Uh, So approximately 24% of institutional crypto asset loans made in 2019 were over collateralized. Again, meaning over collateralized, meaning more than $1 for every dollar that they were loaning out, right? Okay. Uh, but in fact, only 16% were over collateralized. And so anyway, what, what, the, what the SEC is saying is that although BlockFi made other disclosures on his website regarding its risk management practice because of BlockFi's misrepresentation and omission about the level of risk in its loan portfolio, BIA investors did not have complete and accurate information with which to evaluate the risk that in the event of defaults by its institutional borrowers, BlockFi would be unable to comply with its obligation, blah, 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 blah. They got fined $100 million for that? This is ridiculous. And, and the fact that we still have... Who got hurt? And I'm not no trying one. to say they, be yeah, a they pay BlockFi, their, but... They paid their interest. It would be different so, if, they, if they would have figured out that it's a Ponzi scheme and BlockFi is taking in money from investors and that's what they're using to pay people out. That's not yeah. what happened here. They actually had the money. They paid it to people. No one missed their interest payments. And in fact, their interest rates have gone up over time. And we still have grayscale Bitcoin trust that's trading like a 25% discount in no ETF yet. And the SEC says they're protecting investors. It's It, me, it makes no right. sense. Excuse my language, but well, give me an effing break. Seriously. Yes. This is just them like puffing their chest out and showing like, we don't See, like we did this something. stuff. So we did, we, did, yeah. we did something. All right. So Hester Pierce, who is a governor at the SEC, she said... Lurking behind the legal analysis, however, is an important question. Is the approach we're taking with crypto lending the best way to protect crypto lending customers? I do not think so. So I respectfully dissent. Again, she works at the SEC. She wrote, as an initial matter, it is difficult to understand how the civil penalty will protect investors. BlockFi will pay the SEC $50 million and will pay another $50 million in connection with state settlements for the same conduct. While penalties of size are intended to deter bad conduct, here, there is no allegation that BlockFi, failed, that BlockFi uh, failed to pay its customers the money due them or failed to return the crypto lent to it. BlockFi's misrepresentations about over collateralization are serious, but the combined $100 million penalty nevertheless seems disproportionate. So what they have to do is basically they have to register. They have to go through this whole process, which we spoke to Zach. They're, they, they're will, they want to do it. They want to register. Yes. They just they so need not, some, They need clarity. Right. Yeah, they're now going to have a registered yield product. It would have been nice if the SEC would have said, go through these six steps before we ever get to fining you for it. Like the taking the money just seems it, it's like a mob practice almost essentially, right? It doesn't make sense to me. So now they're going to come out with a regulated yield product and I'll be interested to see. So you can't put if you have an account like me, you can't put money in anymore. Um, are you taking you can't open are you, a new are you, account. Are you, are you worried about your money? Are you taking your money out? No, I, no, I'm not going to. So they said they're still paying interest on it. And if they're not bringing more money in, I'm sure they're probably going to be fine. And now they're going to come out with it with a regulated product. I will be interested to see if a regulated product will be different or if it'll be a lower interest rate or what the case will be. I'll be interested to see what happens of it. But uh, yeah, I didn't I didn't think this is like some black eye for BlockFi. I think this is this is reflects more poorly on the SEC than anything because they 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 missed this. I agree. And then last thing, I think this is important. So forgive me. Hester Pierce concluded her post saying, These products matter to people. A program that allows people, and not just affluent people, to keep their crypto assets while still earning a return is valuable to many Americans as evidenced by the program's popularity in the United States to date. The investor protection objective of today's settlements will be poorly served if retail investors are ultimately shut out from participation in these products. Second, our process speaks volumes about our integrity as a regulator. Inviting people to come in and talk to us only to drag them through a difficult, lengthy, unproductive, and labyrinth regulatory process casts the commission in a bad light and thus makes us a less effective regulator. Third, That's crazy. This was on the SEC yeah, website, like, right? This is not us. I'm literally quoting somebody who works at the SEC. Third, yeah. and this is the last one. A company that tries to do the right thing should be met across the table by a regulator that tries to get it to a sensible result in a reasonable time frame. 
For the sake of the American public, our own reputation, and the companies that heed our call to come in and talk to us, we need to do better than we have so far at accommodating innovation through thoughtful use of the exemptive authority Congress gave us. Jeez. Right? That felt like a movie. That felt like a movie speech. That was my uh, that was my Independence Day speech. All right. Good for good for Hunter Pierce. Much needed. Okay. So yeah, right. I'm yeah, I'm not moving as that's out. I'm not that worried about it. And uh, and I have moved money on and off the platform multiple times. They they've done a very good job. It, it's like my Marcus account where if I move money out, it's there like the next business day. And even if I move a decent amount of money out, uh, so obviously. Not <laughs> so obviously there was a lot of misinformation being spread on the internet. Somebody posted a, a well-known account posted that over collateralized numbers and said, sit there, there's, there's no collateral. And it's like, whoa, whoa, that's not true at all. Yeah. And so this is the problem with the internet as we, as we well know, unfortunately, the disinformation, the misinf- it spreads so quickly. And as an example, uh, somebody tweeted about Peloton, the departing CEO, $119 million in stock sales. Peloton's departing president, $105 million in stock sales, 2,800 laid off workers, complimentary Peloton memberships. And I get it. <laughs> I, I get the injustice uh, of it all. But the Peloton CEO. You think they got uh, a free bike too? I hope they got a free bike too. And I believe founder of the company, this is what it is. You, 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 we should be rewarding these, these, these behaviors. Again, in the context of this, I understand the tweet and I'm definitely – Sympathetic to the people that got laid off, but just uh, Twitter and the internet as a as a powder keg, it sucks. Yes, right. The CEO didn't do anything wrong. He built a company, was selling his stock to get liquidity, like every other CEO founder ever uh, has ever done. Diversification and and the business is going through a rough spell. And this is what you know. This is this is what happens. Anyway, so what's going on with Peloton, Ben? Let's do great quarter guys here. I, I don't know what's going on with Pel. I, I mean, it sounds like they're they're they the new guy they brought in is like 69 years old. So it sounds nice. to me like this is a this is a person you now this is a person you bring in to sell a company, right? I don't know why you not like they're bringing in some young energetics. They're going to sell the company, don't you think? There's a really high high probability that's going to happen. Um, I see I see no other another what? route for that. So we spoke about Amazon. Amazon should sweep the floor. And buy all the Peloton machines for three hundred bucks. Yes, yes. Why? Why not? And I'm sure people would sell them used too. Uh, I I think I trust Amazon to do this. It makes sense. Uh, I didn't ben, really. Are you, to are you still? Are you still uh, holding Zilla? Say okay. I, I am. I uh, I'm a buy and hold investor, Michael. So I this is one of the few quarter calls that I took a look at last week because I said, what happened? They had this story in the Wall Street Journal. They talked about it. They lost $881 million on their houses, which sounds like a lot of money because it is, but it's an average of like $25,000 on every home that they Ooh, sold. Hold on, pause, pause. That's, that's terrible. They lost how? 20... How? Oh, how, how did they, did they do they... that? Yes, <laughs> how? This is the best real estate market to sell a house ever, right? Like, I, I wonder, how I mean, do you lose money? I wonder if every buyer is like uh, those idiots. I, I, well, I wonder, they, it sounds like they I'm sorry, sold every seller, fast. every seller. They sold them faster than they thought. So I know they sold a bunch of them like in bulk to some other institutional investors. So I wonder if they said, we're going to buy all these houses from you and make it easier and get them off your balance sheet, but you have to give us a discount. I don't know if that's what it is. But listen to this, though. This is from the report. Housing-related transaction fees were roughly $300 billion in 2021. This includes residential real estate, mortgages, rentals, title, escrow. It does not include stuff like renovations and home insurance. So they're saying, like, we want to we want to take this over. $300 billion. Yes, in 2021. Uh, and they said, and so they're basically saying, we're going to create this super app that helps do all of this. And I think that sounds awesome because the, the, the TAM is huge. But I think they've shown doing at scale, the real estate market is impossible to, to like take over at scale. You cannot, they, the, the super app they want to do to handle all this stuff, it's probably not going to happen. So oh, listen so to this you, stuff. So, so you a seller? Revenue for the core segment of Zillow based on home listings on its website rose 30% in 2021 compared to the previous year. Margins on that business were 45%, up from 38%. Why don't they just stick to this same core business and not try to take over the whole real estate market? Because guess what? You just showed you cannot do that. It's, it's not, I don't think anyone can do it, frankly. And obviously they, more than anyone, who, who lost $25,000 per house in the best seller's market in history, maybe just pump the brakes and just do the core Zillow part and and have that be the business. Yeah. What do I know? Well, it sounds like that's what they're doing, no? 
well, no, they said they're going to create this super app that tries to take that tries to do uh, be a realtor and refinance and title and escrow and mortgages and rentals and all. They want to do like they want to take over the. They still have this world domination thing. I don't. Uh, I don't buy it. So Chipotle, uh, what's going on with the stock? Chipotle had a good quarter, I think. Deep. Hey, do you know anyone who says Chipotle? Oh, it's that's. No, I don't think I do. I've heard it. How, it's offensive. I, it, it's like nails on a chalkboard for me. Chipotle. I can't take it. Anyway. Uh, revenue of 22%. Comp stores, or comp restaurants, I should say. 15%. Damn. That's quarter over quarter? Pretty, pretty good. All right, digital sales. There are now 42% of sales. So every time I walk in there, I used to be the only one who did the app and my food be waiting for me. No one orders from the counter anymore. It's all from the app and people just walk in and pick it up. It's like they have like an assembly line now where it's just people making to-go orders. And, it, and honestly, frankly, that makes more sense because getting in line, behind people go, add a little bit more. Yeah, there. I hate, I hate no, it. And yeah. I, get, I get nervous. I get like embarrassed. I don't know why, but I feel like people are yes. like judging you for what you order. Yes. Okay. So they raised prices. We had Sean, our new research analyst, check this out for us. He said, they're, even though they raised prices and, and everything costs so much more, their operating margin grew 5% year over year. Gross profit margin was up 30% year over year. So people, all these companies complaining about higher costs of commodities and chicken and beef and all this stuff, they're doing just fine. Yes. They, they don't, this isn't, an, obviously there's some companies that's impacting. A place like Chipotle, not at all. Right? Well, like I, like I said, they're, they're about to lose my business. I'm just saying. They think that they have six more Not rate. Me. They think they have six more rate hikes for burrito bowls. They got another thing coming. Hey, can, can I do a humble brag here? Please. So when I order online, it they have all these charities, and it says, "Would you like to round up?" And every time, it yeah, sure, I'll pay. I'll give eighty cents to whatever. Uh, I got an email saying that I was in the top one percent of all round up people in the country for Chipotle customers. It's got to feel nice. I think it, what it really says is that I eat Chipotle a lot. <laughs> so maybe that's it. All right, Disney. I got so we talked about Disney last week because I was there, and then what day did they announce? Tuesday, I can't remember. All the days last week kind of rolled together. Everyone said Ben kind of called it, and called what? The fact that Disney had a blowout quarter because of their park. So their park, their park revenue was up a hundred percent year over year, which for me to to see, I think here's my call of the next six to nine months. If we don't get some other crazy wave. We're going to see a vacation boom unlike anyone we've, any we've ever seen in this country. So I went to Disney in the early February, right? Kids are still in school. It's not spring break. It's, it's usually a downtime at the park. It was hopping. They were, we were getting alerts saying parks are at capacity. There are no more tickets for sale to get into the park. And of course, again, we pulled our kids from school for this. You know, I might, I might buy Disney. Uh, on the on the earnest call, they said international travelers, which were historically eighteen to twenty percent of visitors, have yet to return. Yes, and the the one thing is, we stayed at a Disney resort, and the resort actually still felt a little thin, and so I think people were staying off site and then coming to the park. But again, packed for a fed. I think spring break is going to be nuts. So we got back from Disney. And we said, all right, we got the vacation itch. We're, we we haven't. That was our first vacation in like two years, besides somewhere in Michigan. You know, we want to go again. So we look for spring break. The, basically, the whole state of Florida is booked. We couldn't find anything for spring break. And it, it's in like six or eight weeks, so that kind of makes sense. But I think, yeah, they said that, that there's no international travelers yet. When that comes out, I think Disney, here's the other thing. They have so many brands. Like, the we went to Hollywood Studios and Magic Kingdom and Epcot, which I'm going to rescind my Epcot take. Epcot oh, think, is great. Yeah, a terrible take. But it's a good take if you have little kids. Epcot is not great for little kids. What, what's, here's the thing. Wait, hold on. I have a question. What's, what's okay. the place in Epcot? Is it like an innovation land or something like that? It's Tomorrowland, I think. Tomorrowland? Futureland? Something like that, yeah. I, don't, I mean, it's so funny because it looks all – the, all the future stuff from Epcot and Disney looks like it. future people thought in 1960. I'm supposed to be going next year uh, with my family in February break, though, because that's the only time Robin could take off. Okay. I'm, I'm Same time as, so here's like so we went to Epcot. It rained, and I I thought, okay, this sucks. It's raining. It's not very fun. But guess what? You can get a beer anywhere in Epcot. So what did I do? I started drinking, <laughs> and I figured out I figured out something. I have the perfect number of beers during the day for a dad or a mom for a parent. You, you can't have too many, right? Because you have to still care of kids. 
Three beers yeah. is the perfect amount of beers. Yeah. Well, it depends what type of Be- beers. Because you're, are you a Pilsner guy? I'm an IPA guy, so I can't have three. I could have two. Okay, I don't do it. Yeah, I stay away from IPAs. But I can see how Epcot would be a blast if you were older without kids and did a food and drinking tour. Like, I could see how that'd be a lot of fun. So I was wrong on Epcot. But again, totally packed. And I think we're going to see this where in, you had to wear masks everywhere indoors at Disney. And so the COVID stuff, it was kind of annoying, whatever. I'm not going to be able to complain about masks, but I think people have just moved on and I couldn't believe how packed it was. So Disney had like amazing numbers. And yeah. here's the thing. They yeah. have so many brands. They don't even have a Marvel section of their parks yet. Like oh, wow. how big is that going to, so, and I'm not, I'm not a star Wars person at all. I think that it's the most overrated movie franchise just ever. Just stop, just stop. Send me your, send me your, it is from uh, a movie uh, perspective. Matthew, not, edit, Matthew, edit that out. Not from a pulp, from pop <laughs> culture, but mo- from a movie perspective, I think they're overrated, but the star Wars whole set of the park at Hollywood studios was amazing. And my, my son who's four is a huge star Wars guy. Now he, they have their own lightsabers. Now he, he is huge into Star Wars, and I was like, okay, I kind of get it, and it made sense. I, I, part of me respects the people that go to Disney every year, like as a tradition. Shout to my part kids of me, in LA. Part of me also thinks those people are insane because my wife and I said we're not coming back here for years, if ever. <laughs> it was like something we were glad we did, and I got amazing memories from my kids, and it got better as the week went along. Um, but uh, it's it's definitely overwhelming with people and lines and work and but yeah i want to say one one final thing on disney though um i just mentioned i might i might buy it but i am i am a little bit nervous about about the other side of the business so traditional tv segments espn and abc revenue fell 13 percent. not great and that's only going down they should spin out espn that's my take and they spoke about uh the content spend the CEO said, "Content, content, content. Like they're just they're trying to put out one thing, one new thing a week. They're gonna. I think they're on track to spend thirty three billion dollars in content. Well, they need to, right, to get more. So it sounds like their subscribers came in hotter than expected. And they're gonna. They need to to get more. But so this to, this to is to the pro- this is the problem because what Netflix is now on sort of on the other side of that, where I don't know how much more subscribers they can get, and now it's just a game of churning out, of pumping out content. Like how good a business is that?" Good question, but that that's the recurring revenue that they want, I'm sure. Uh, but what's interesting is that Disney is, the stock is basically back to the levels uh, of where it was before the pandemic. I don't know that's sensitive. That's not interesting. I'm sorry. Oh, no. it's No, that's a Disney Plus, plus launch date. That's what I wanted to see. Okay, that is interesting. So Disney added this amazing business. I just said the it's amazing. The stock's gone nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like your Netflix theory about how Netflix yeah. price is the same as it was in 2018. All right, uh, last, I think last one, um, Affirm. Oh boy, this is hilarious. Hey, the, were we right or were we right about this? About what? I think we can, can we, that we said the buy now, pay later just doesn't make sense to us as a business. Is, it, Cre- is this a too early of a victory lap? Credit to us. Uh, okay. They tweeted another great quarter, blah, blah, blah. Whatever they tweeted, the stock was up 11%. No, they then, tweeted the results early, though. That's yeah, the problem. Yeah, and, and then they deleted the tweet, and the stock crashed. It was <laughs> down. <laughs> it was down like thirty percent after the tweet. Whoops! Someone's on LinkedIn looking for a new social media manager role at this point. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's, t- t- <laughs> tough scene. Tough scene. So the the stock fell twenty percent or something. Well, yeah, operating loss of one hundred ninety six million dollars compared to twenty six million in the second quarter. Not great. I see. I just I don't get how this business. I I don't get everything. I bought airline tickets. The other day, uh, we are going back to Florida and you could use a firm to buy airline tickets, like $49 a month to pay off airline tickets. I just, I don't get so it. So here's the thing. We spoke about this with Twitter. And now that this is that big of a number, I mean, well, actually it is a big number. How much they're spending to hire people and just stock-based compensation. One of the reasons why uh, Twitter stock has gone nowhere is just they just keep d- diluting existing shareholders. Uh, $82 million in stock-based comp. In the, in the second quarter. Jeez. That'll do it. This is from Barron's. Super Bowl Sunday. Betters are on track to wager $7.6 billion on the game, up 80% from the year ago almost. Uh, so they're showing these numbers, like how legal sports gambling is now in 30 states, and the numbers are just growing by the day. I, I love sports gambling. It's awesome. It's the best. But over the last year, DraftKings and Penn are both down 60%. This is another reason... Buying stocks is hard. 
Uh, so, so you see these numbers like sports gambling is going to be huge, and these sports gambling stocks are getting crushed. Same thing with 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 when marijuana became legal. Everyone's wants to buy the pot stocks. There's so much competition. The num the amount of incentives that these companies are giving out, they are just eating each other's. Yes, they're just eating each other's lunch. By the way, not to brag, I I bet pretty heavy on the Rams. Just saying. Okay, I I'm a diversified diversified target date investor, you know, and I had a. An early, I bought last year the day they traded Stafford. I put 150 bucks in the Rams win the Super Bowl. It would have paid out like $2,200. And so I had to go into the game thinking I either win $2,200 or I lose it all. I talked about this on Spaces. Did you hedge? And I talked and I talked to you. I didn't know what to do. So I could have bet the Bengals money line for like $750 would have given me a $1,200 return. Essentially, I would have gotten $1,200 either way if I would have done that. And I hedged at halftime. And I'm, I'm okay with that decision because the Bengals could have, should have, would have won maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, so I'm, I was, I'm okay with that decision. I was, I was very nervous there for a little bit. Um, oh, uh, I like the Bills next year. Seven, seven to one odds. Okay, so I put, I put some money. I took some of my winnings and I rolled it into the Chiefs, Bills, and maybe one other team. I also like the Ravens as a so. long shot. I think they were nineteen to one. Those, those kind of bets are kind of fun. So much fun. Where you put it in and then you worry about it later. Okay, so this is something that's happening from the Fed, I guess, from them moving markets. This is from Freddie Mac. The 30-year fixed rate mortgage is now at 3.7%. 15 years almost at three. These were at like 2.7 and 2.2 in August. Did we re- did we so, refi at the bottom or did we refi at the bottom? Pretty darn close. If rising in mortgage rates don't slow the housing market, I'm not sure what will. Like, does it? Will. Isn't this kind? Of, you think yeah. so? I, I'm not so sure. It it should in theory. I'm not so sure it will. But I think I mean, if, if this there, doesn't do it, well, I don't know what will. There is a level. I'm not saying that we're there right now, but there is a level, absolutely. There's a tipping point. I don't know where it is, but it's there. But I, I wonder if it's more like four and a half or five as opposed to to four. Could be. Because but, at the same point, like people still, my our age, uh, not your age, you're old. People my age still need to buy houses. <laughs> um, but so what, what, it will, what it will do is it won't necessarily slow them down from moving. It'll just, it'll just bring prices in, I hope. Okay. So, so yeah, maybe, maybe people use that as a, as, as a way to negotiate Yeah, because it's a, hey, my monthly payment's going to be higher. I don't know if sellers will balk at that or well, not. Well, they won't have a choice. 